We have Miss Gobbo on the line. Can you hear me, Miss Gobbo? Yes, I can. She's the name on everyone's lips. Nicola Gobbo is the missing piece in the jigsaw. The lawyer who wanted it all. I've been asked to make a special thank you. One of her key clients was Carl Williams. How close was their relationship? That was very close. Two timing the cops and the drug lords for 15 years. This is the biggest scandal in Australian criminal history, without a shadow of a doubt. Adam Shan goes behind the headlines. She was a friend of yours. She was a friend. To reveal a story of murder, drugs, and abuse of power. How deep was the breach of trust? Absolutely total betrayal. For 127 days so far, the Royal Commission into the Management of Police Informants in Victoria held public hearings. This Royal Commission was about one informer in particular, Nicola Gobbo, the barrister who turned informer, and everyone wanted to see her. But Nicola Gobbo loved to be the centre of attention, so she kept us all waiting until the final days of the hearing to make her appearance. Are you going to take the oath or the affirmation? Uh, and the oath. Yes. All right, then. When, under threat of jail, Nicola Gobbo finally appeared, it was via video link. Gobbo feared for her safety if her face was shown. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give... The only one to see her was Royal Commissioner Margaret McMurdo. But at last, some of what Gobbo knew and why she took down her own clients was revealed. Tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Most of the crooks that Gobbo informed on deserve to be in jail, and I struggle to have much sympathy for them. But what matters to me are two unsolved murders from the period when the barrister was operating as Informer 3838. Let's firstly re-examine the 2003 murder of Shane Chartres Abbott. We investigated this last year, but there were some big unanswered questions including the identity of an undercover operative the police used. We now know that this was Nicola Gobbo, the X Factor in a botched investigation that's cost taxpayers more than $30 million, with no result. A male prostitute murdered outside his reservoir home this morning had been described in court as a self-proclaimed vampire and accused of ripping out the tongue of a woman. This was no ordinary murder. The victim, Shane Chartres Abbott, was a male escort. For three years, the police investigation went nowhere. But in 2006, there was a breakthrough. Who was the prisoner who cryptically wrote vampire on the palm of his hand? We still can't name him for legal reasons. Last year in our report, we referred to him as the author, and so he shall remain. The author is a career criminal who was serving a life sentence in Barwon Jail when he confessed to the murder of Shane Chartres Abbott. Strangely, when the police took the author's confession, they allowed him to face the wall instead of facing the camera. I decided to help eliminate a person whom I regard as an animal and a danger to other females. It was a revenge killing. But why would the author confess? And how does Nicola Gobbo fit into this story? You have to go back to Melbourne in the mid-2000s. A man whose body was found in a Brunswick street on Saturday night may be the 25th person to die in Melbourne's gangland war. The gangland war was in its final throes. Most of the bosses and their paid killers were in jail awaiting trial. Victoria Police was under immense pressure to get convictions so these criminals would never see the light of day. Barwon Jail was used as a pressure cooker to turn criminals into informers. They were locked down 23 hours a day, often in solitary confinement, and visits from family and friends were limited. For a long time, some of the heaviest gangsters in the country had no idea that their barrister was double-crossing them. It was a brazen and audacious betrayal. 
I'm David McCulloch, and I spent 13 years and four months in Bowen Prison. For a crime you didn't commit? For a crime I didn't commit on that occasion, yes. David McCulloch watched this Royal Commission very closely. As a former inmate at Barwon, he observed firsthand Gobbo's movements within the prison. We met with him just before he was deported from Australia after submitting evidence of corruption in his case. There's a pretty strict system how people come into Barwon as lawyers to see their clients. What happened in her case? She would come in to see one particular client and would be given access to several clients. And nothing recorded? Off the record, yes. And what would be the purpose of those multi-client meetings? It was so that she could have access to those that she was, those inmates. She was trying to turn for Vic Paul to become informers against other inmates. Gobbo was a regular visitor to the author in Barwon Prison before he made a statement confessing to the Chartres Abbott murder in 2006. Over the next six years, he made a total of seven statements. Well, in a lot of ways, what the Royal Commission has shown is that Nicola Gobbo was the missing link. She was running information from the author to her police handlers. Her police handlers were filing that information into police. It became this circular exchange of information which helps to explain why his story changed quite substantially over a number of years. Victoria needs an independent, broad-based anti-corruption commission and we call on the Victorian government to establish such a commission. In order to avoid growing calls for a royal commission into police corruption, Police chose to believe the author's constantly changing story, which incriminated serving and former Victoria police officers in the Chartres Abbott murder. Gobbo played a leading role in this dubious process. She was a friend of yours? She was a friend, and I socialised with her as a friend. They were tasking her to come and see me, provide me with false information, and pretend that she was giving me legal advice. David Waters had history with Victoria Police. He was charged with the ripoff of a drug dealer while still in the job. After being found innocent of that charge, he was trying to rebuild his life when the author, an old enemy of his, made up a big lie about him. The author claimed that after he killed Shane Chartres Abbott in 2003, he gave the murder weapon to David Waters. He said Waters kept it for three days before the author took it back and threw it in Port Phillip Bay. This was a highly dubious claim, and Nicola Gobbo was enlisted to massage it into fact. So, Dave, we're on Racecourse Road, Flemington. What's the significance of this location? In late 2009, early 2010, um, Nicola Gobbo came to me and said she had some information that the author had made a statement that was in that by that time that it implicated me further in the murder of Chartres Abbott and that he had alleged that after the murder he'd come here that morning straight after and handed me the gun. So I was apparently meant to be here at the hotel or within the vicinity of it. Where were you actually, Dave? I was uh, in Mooney Ponds. I was at a place called Poynton's Nursery. Poynton's Nursery in Mooney Ponds is nearly three kilometres from the pub on Racecourse Road. This is where I actually was on the morning that I was allegedly at Racecourse Road at the same time. So not in Racecourse Road, not in Flemington, not picking up a gun? No, picking up a latte in here with members of the city of Mooney Valley who I was working for at the time. We had a meeting in relation to the next schedule of works for the next month. In 2010, Waters was running an earth-moving business, as he had been since the Chartres Abbott murder. His only mistake, telling Nicola Gobbo the truth when she came to see him. Miraculously, a statement appears by the author, 2012. He said he had some things to do which required him driving to the Mooney Ponds Junction. So they've changed his statement, his movements, to move him towards where I was. 
And Nicola Gobbo's role as the undercover agent in all this is to massage those two stories to get them closer together, going back and forth to you. Trying to get them somewhere where they're close. The whole strategy failed, you weren't charged. I wasn't charged with anything, and the whole thing fell apart. It was just ridiculous from the outset. The case by the author, with the help of Gobbo, collapsed when he recanted key evidence at his Supreme Court trial in 2014. So where did that leave Dave Waters? David, all through this period, Nicola Gobbo was your legal counsel, she was your friend, but she thoroughly double-crossed you and put you in the frame for a murder. Look, the further this goes on, the more that's revealed from the Royal Commission, it just becoming an absolute act of bastardry. When you, you know, like I've held back a fair bit with my emotions in relation to this, but it's just betrayal. And if it wasn't for the involvement of Victoria Police, particularly the Briars Task Force and the um, hierarchy, she would never have been able to do it. Dave Waters wasn't the only one whose reputation was brought into question. Peter Laylor, who was a serving detective, was hounded from the force in 2009 after the author claimed that Laylor and Waters were working together to assist him in the murder. To this day, they remain suspects, though they have never been charged. If they had have charged us, and we had have been in the Supreme Court in 2014, we would have exposed what's coming out at the Royal Commission now because we would have got all those documents. There would have been no reason to hide them from the defence. And what would have happened, you would have had this Royal Commission in 2015-16 and some of these members of the Briars, Petra and Piranhas Task Force would be starting their incarceration now. This would have been done and dusted. Because Gobbo's name would have come out. It would have come out. It would have been obvious. We always knew there was something crook at the centre of this case. Nicola Gobbo is the missing piece in the jigsaw. We can see now where this thing went so wrong. This was the most expensive mess Victoria Police ever got itself into. The decision to pursue innocent men to deflect political pressure over the gangland war was ill-founded. And the Chartres Abbott investigation, from promising beginnings, ended in total failure. Layla and Waters have never been exonerated over the Chartres Abbott murder. Do you see yourself any closer now to getting that exoneration? I do. Um, we ourselves will be moving in a certain direction and we've got legal advice in relation to that. Compensation? I think so, but whatever it takes, we'll get there because nobody is going to stand up in the courts now and defend these actions. We've suffered, and there's no doubts about that, and a lot of other people have been put through hell over this. But the important thing is to go back to what this was all about. And it was a murder. A bloke was murdered in his front yard. It was a solvable homicide, but they've undermined the whole murder investigation, perverted it, and turned it into, you know, a vehicle for their own perverse agendas. It's really, it's a wretched outcome to this entire episode. And it's difficult to see how you could go back now and, and get any kind of a clean run at solving this case. Ultimately, it's justice denied to the family of Shane Shah Sabbath. I'm going to leave the last word on this to Sandra Gibson, one of the last people to see Shane Shah Sabbath alive. She was his counsellor and confidant. It was Sandra who convinced me to search beyond the headlines and discover the truth. I feel like I've given you false hope, Sandra. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> oh, look, I probably knew that this is probably as far as we could get because, I mean, you're talking about the zenith of power, the justice system, police, you know, politicians. I mean, I just think the whole sanctity of the system has been blown out of the water. And I think this is just, you know, the, a, a nail in the coffin, really over the injustice of the whole system. Coming up... She's always been a very different cat. Gobbo's double life and her drug-dealing boyfriend. She probably shouldn't have gone into the, into the family business. Melbourne's gangland war claimed more than 30 lives between 1998 and 2006. Victoria Police would have you believe that they brought peace to the streets through hard work 
and innovative investigation techniques. But that's not quite how it happened. The truth is police made a desperate deal with a barrister, Nicola Gobbo, who agreed to inform on her underworld clients, breaching the bond of secrecy between lawyer and client. The seeds of her double dealing were sown well before the gangland war even began. In 1972, Nicola Mary Gobbo was born into a legal dynasty. Her uncle was a Supreme Court judge and a Victorian governor. Her cousin is a QC and her estranged sister, Catherine, a commercial lawyer. At school, she was known as bright and studious with ambitions to become prime minister, but her life followed a very different direction. She's always been a, a very different cat. Even in her days as a law student, she was living with a drug dealer in, in a uh, notorious drug house. In 1993, while she was still at university, Gobbo was charged with drug trafficking after a police raid on her Carlton share house uncovered 1.4 kilograms of amphetamines. She gave up two flatmates to police, including her boyfriend, and they went to jail. But no conviction was recorded against Gobbo. Instead, she was registered as a police informer in 1995. People often say that she was a lawyer who turned to the dark side, but what came out in the Royal Commission was that she was a crook first who became a lawyer. Is that fair to say? Yes. I mean, she comes from a very famous Melbourne family of lawyers, but she probably shouldn't have gone into the, into the family business. Gobbo's double life as an informer stroke barrister continued off and on for 17 years until 2010. But her true identity was not revealed until 2019. Good evening. The identity of Lawyer X, who snitched on high-profile gangland clients, can finally be revealed as former defence barrister Nicola Gobbo. She led a double life, representing gangland clients like Carl Williams and Tony Mockbell, all the while informing on them to police. For the journalist who broke the story, it's been a five-year battle to reveal the biggest legal scandal in Victoria's history. There are people out there who may not know that they've, their cases have been tainted or, in fact, that they've, their court cases were somewhat of a fraud. You got the story of this time, if not all time. Thank you. Lawyer X. When did you first become aware of the story? It was around about the summer of 2013, 2014. She'd had some contact with police and she'd been through a civil claim, working out what was behind the writ and what was behind uh, her motivations. There was a lot more to her and that's what I ended up finding out. You obviously take your concerns to Victoria Police. We called them on the day that we were going to publish and within hours um, we were being taken to court trying to work out what we could and couldn't print the next day and that went on for a week and uh, that ended up going on for five years. The fight went all the way to the High Court which finally revealed Gobbo was Lawyer X. Within hours, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews had called a Royal Commission. Nicola Gobbo has finally given evidence to the Lawyer X Royal Commission, revealing she couldn't say no to detectives who wanted information from her. For many, Gobbo's appearance was an anti-climax. It seemed the Commission just needed Gobbo to confirm what they already knew, that she played dual roles as barrister and consort to criminals who she later informed on. And by doing this, she may have broken the law and you were aware that by turning up and providing advice to him, you were in effect um, doing things which would have a tendency to pervert the course of justice? Potentially. Well, you were aware uh, of that, weren't you? That that could happen, yes. This is the biggest scandal in Australian criminal history, without a shadow of a doubt. Police can't operate without public confidence. So this is this really narrow blue line, what are there, 15,000 coppers in Victoria? If they don't have the confidence of the public, they can't basically do their day-to-day -day work. And this strikes at the absolute heart of it. What went wrong inside Vic Pol? I mean, where was the adult in the room? Didn't anybody see that this was going to end up in this situation? I think it was such a tantalising prospect to have someone come over, walk 
across that line and tell them the things that they probably knew to be true, but to lay it out for them. And it would have been like a, a bit of a drug. Once they got a little bit of a taste of what she could offer, the information was so good and so accurate that it was hard to give up. So she kept on being able to make a comeback because she enjoyed it. She enjoyed informing, she enjoyed the attention. You know, looking back with hindsight, um, my level of emotional maturity was hopeless. And, you know, as pathetic as, as it is for me to admit, I did derive some um, self-importance and some feeling that I was you know, relevant or validated by reason of being wanted by people like Tony. Next, Gobbo's connection to murder. The bodies were found by the couple's son in their living room at six o'clock last night. And her ultimate betrayal. I would um, never have gone near her in a, with a 40-foot pole if I had known she was a police informer. I first met Nicola Gobbo in the summer of 2003, just as her informing was ramping up. I wanted to meet her client, Carl Williams, who was killing the most powerful crooks of Melbourne. She agreed to deliver a letter on my behalf, and on her recommendation, I got the interview. Within a few months, Williams was facing life in jail, courtesy of Nicola Gobbo. I've been asked to make a special thank you. You can say three cheers. No, you can. You can. Thank you, Frank. Three, three cheers. One of her key clients was Carl Williams, who you knew before prison and also in prison as well. How close was their relationship? It was very close. But when she had a relationship with someone, she seemed to have the capacity to make it appear that that person was the only person in her life. Gobbo also had Tony Mockbell on her books. She worked just as hard for him often getting him bail against the odds. What a beautiful day. All right. The second case I've long followed relates to when Williams and Mockbell were working together in 2003-04. It's my belief they were both connected to a heinous double murder in the Melbourne suburb of Kew. I also believe Nicola Gobbo knows more than she's letting on about this crime. I'm talking about the execution-style slaying of Terry and Christine Hodgson. Forensic teams have been at the East Q residence all morning, piecing together clues to the murder of a husband and wife in their home. The bodies were found by the couple's son in their living room at 6 o'clock last night. There were no signs of a struggle. The pair appear to have died from gunshot wounds to the head. The murders of Terry and Christine Hodson are still reverberating through the corridors of justice in Melbourne. Christine was collateral damage, killed because she was a witness to Terry's murder. As a long-time police informant, Terry Hodson was a marked man. Eight months before his murder, he was caught robbing a drug house at Oakley in Melbourne South West with one of his police handlers, Detective Sergeant David Meeshel. Meeshel's boss, Detective Sergeant Paul Dale, was said to have masterminded the theft of more than a million dollars in cash and drugs, which belonged to underworld kingpin Tony Mockbell. Before his murder, Hodson had refused an offer of witness protection from the police, brokered by his lawyer, Nicola Gobbo. Gobbo was also representing Tony Mockbell, whose drugs and cash Hodson had stolen. Hodson was also a well-known police informer. It was remarkable he'd survived this long. The police never went after Mockbell for the Hodson murders. Their prime suspect was Paul Dale, who was accused of being behind the Oakley drug house burglary with fellow officer David Meeshel. When Hodson was killed in May 2004, Michel had agreed to give evidence against Dale over the burglary on the advice of his lawyer, Nicola Gobbo. At the same time, Gobbo was also the lawyer for Mockbell and Carl Williams. This is Nine News with Peter Hitchener. 
Good evening. A Supreme Court jury has heard explosive allegations that Carl Williams organised the murder of police informer Terence Hodson for former detective Paul Dale. In statements Williams made to police, he claimed he was paid $150,000 for arranging the hit. With Carl Williams as a witness, Victoria Police believed they had enough to charge Dale with the Hodson murders. After years of being a suspect, today Paul Dale officially became an alleged killer. We're nearly five years down the track. It's been a very long, complex and difficult investigation. Officers from the Petra Task Force arresting the former drug squad detective at his Wangaratta service station this morning. Nicola Gobbo's role in the arrest of Paul Dale played out in this Albert Park cafe in December 2008. At the behest of Victoria Police, she wore a listening device. She steered the conversation, quizzing Dale about his relationship with Carl Williams and his conversations with the police and what he may have left out. Dale thought he was talking to his friend, his lawyer, not an undercover agent. She's asking him about his uh, case and what police are doing with him, and he's uh, divulging to her that he's being questioned by the Australian Crime Commission. She takes all that back, and on the basis of that, that gets them over the line to charge him with a murder. Dale later told the Royal Commission he had no idea of Gobbo's relationship with Victoria Police. I would um, never have gone near her in a, with a 40-foot pole if I had a known she was a police informer. She goes beyond being a snitch, she goes beyond being a double dealer to actually being an undercover operative for Victoria Police. That's exactly what she was. And so, in a sense, she's at a completely different level to all the other Supergrass witnesses that were used by police to sort of crack open the gangland wars and to, and to get convictions over the line. She's in much deeper uh, than the rest of them in terms of what she's willing to do for Victoria Police. And, you know, the crazy thing being, of course, that this is at the expense of many of her clients at the time. In an interview with the ABC 7.30 report that went to air before Gobbo's appearance at the Royal Commission, she spoke of the Hodson murders. Did you know the Hodsons were going to be murdered? Absolutely not. Detectives suspected that you were partly responsible for the leak of his informer status before his death. The Did you? whole world knew that he was an informer. The fact that he was murdered wasn't a great surprise. The way it happened, appalling and shocking, definitely, but not surprising in the context of the way he was living his life prior to his murder. And I don't mean to speak ill of someone who's deceased, um, but you know, he was, it was known that he was assisting police. He was also uh, running his drug trafficking business with the imprimatur of Victoria Police. In her interview with the ABC, Gobbo denied that she knew the Hodsons were to be murdered. We make no allegation, but she didn't tell the ABC that she was with a leading suspect on the night of the murders. A key lieutenant of Mockbell, Azam Ahmed, was the manager of the Oakley drug house that Hodson robbed. Gobbo was Ahmed's lawyer and lover. At the same time, Gobbo was helping police in their pursuit of Paul Dale. It all came undone in 2010 in a brutal few seconds inside Barwon Prison. At about 12.48 p.m. this afternoon, Carl Williams was seated at a table. One of the other inmates struck him to the head a number of times with a heavy instrument, and Carl has died at the scene. The murder charges against Paul Dale were dropped after the Crown's main witness, Carl Williams, was bashed to death inside Barwon Prison. An angry Dale maintains his innocence over the Oakley burglary and the Hodson's murders. He told the Royal Commission the fix was in when he met Gobbo for coffee. It was set up by Victoria Police user Nicola Gobbo when I was in her presence. Just like the Chartres Abbott matter, the police went with their informer in defiance of conflicting evidence. Both murders remain unsolved to this day. And consider the children of the Hodsons. They discovered the bodies of their parents in the family home. No, 
Nothing will ever take that memory away, nothing. No amount of counselling. You can't move on, not until you get some sort of closure. At least if we can name and shame this person, um, yeah, then we might be able to rest a little bit easier. Next. He was definitely in love with her and believed also she loved him. Did Gobbo take her lover to the cleaners? How much? I think the figure mentioned was in the region of a million dollars. For much of her career, Nicola Gobbo found herself in a netherworld of crooks and cops. She crossed the line to intimacy with men on both sides of the law and found herself sinking deeper into the mire. Paul Dale spent time in jail over the Hodson murders, but to this day, he remains sympathetic to Gobbo's predicament, blaming Victoria Police for recruiting Gobbo as an informer in the first place. A disgraceful act by Victoria Police, and I feel sorry for Nicola Gobbo because she was forced to do it. Let's go back to Adam Ahmed, the manager of the Mockbell drug house, which was burgled in 2003. We know that Ahmed was dining with Nicola Gobbo on the night that the Hodsons were murdered in 2004. Their relationship and its bearing on the Hodson murders was never fully explored at the Royal Commission. He was definitely in love with her and believed also truly that she loved him. I do believe that they were planning to get married and spend a life together, yeah. David McCulloch knew Ahmed when they were inmates at Barwon Prison. McCulloch also had the respect of Carl Williams, who was there at the same time. So Ahmed asked McCulloch for a favour in relation to Nicola Gobbo. He had heard through the prison grapevine that Carl was upset with her and had believed that she was an informer. And uh, he was concerned that some harm could come to him. Gobbo was informing on Carl Williams. But she couldn't tell her boyfriend that. So he'd been gulled into believing that she wasn't an informer? Absolutely, yes. What was his demeanour when he was telling you this? He's quite emotional. He's quite a personable sort of guy. Yeah, he's just quite emotional. And so what was his message to you? Could I convey to Carol that she wasn't an informer? And so I just put that to Carl. Why don't you just wait until you're 100% sure? And he acceded to that. So it's fair to say that you possibly saved Gobbo's life? I certainly saved her from being harmed. I don't think she knows that happened. Well, I, I would be one of the only three that know. One is dead, at least two. I haven't told her. That only leaves one. He's not talking to her. And why isn't Ahmed talking to Gobbo? Because when they were planning a life together, they bought a number of properties in her name. Ahmed told inmates that after the relationship soured, he wanted his money back. How much? I think the figure mentioned was in the region of a million dollars. What do we know about what's happened to Gobbo's properties? I mean, people have tried to research what she owns. You can't find it. What's, that, what's actually happened? Victoria Police have taken the step to remove any details of ownership by Miss Gobbo from any properties associated with her. Ahmed wasn't the first lover or client that Gobbo burned, and there seemed to be a pattern. She drew people in, extracted their value and then disposed of them. Well, she'd go above and beyond for a lot of people, and maybe not in Adam's case, but she's got a personality that needs to be in the middle of everything. Uh, I've sort of described it sometimes as running towards the fire and running away from it uh, when it gets too hot and then running back. Um, that's the way she operated for years and years. Why didn't she just pull the pin? Well, this is sort of where we get into the psychology of it all. Even though she's not diagnosed with any particular disorder, she has certainly dependency issues. It may come back from her childhood. Uh, she lost her father when she was a teenager and she lost her mother many years later. She needed the validity of being important to someone. That would be my analysis of it. 
As crazy as a time that was in Melbourne with the gangland killings and, and everything that was going on, um, there's something crazier still about, about Nikhil Gobbo's conduct that stretches a long way back. There's an essential flaw in her makeup, which, which meant that she was rife to be exploited, but also to exploit her, her clients and her contacts with police in this way. What view have you formed about her motivations through all this? Well, I think that's one of the, the more elusive things, why she's done this, she's, she's rationalised it and so forth. There is no question that she was in a hard place. I mean, she was being squeezed between some very serious crooks and some pretty desperate police, and she was compromised. But at the same time, as the Royal Commission showed, she had opportunity to get out of this situation. Coming up. She started really ripping off the crooks in the end. How Gobbo flipped the tables on the bad guys. Once they're arrested, she's uh, the first person to go down uh, to try and bail them out. Gobbo was playing a deadly game. She wanted to please her police handlers by serving up lovers, friends and clients, seeking cash rewards in return. She was the X Factor in two bungled murder cases. But even as word of her treachery was spreading in the underworld, she was preparing for yet another massive deception. And this time, she was courting almost certain death by taking on the Calabrian Mafia. Police believe they've arrested the Mr Biggs after the biggest drug swoop in Victorian history. Among those remanded in custody with 34-year-old Rob Caram of Brunswick. There's never been a bust like it. 4.4 tons, 15 million ecstasy tablets, the approximate street value, $440 million. When Rob Karam was busted for importing a record amount of ecstasy, he had no idea it was his lawyer who was behind his arrest. He'd hired Gobbo on the recommendation of one of his mafia mates. They both found out the hard way she was double-crossing them. There's a great quote in one of the letters that Karam's writing to his mates. Yeah. He's saying, you've got to get a good lawyer. It's like having a Ferrari and taking it to a Nissan mechanic. You've got to get the right mechanic, and I've got the best ones, you know? And he had no idea. She's living the ultimate high-wire act, dealing with both sides like that, giving information from one to the other, which Victoria Police was always worried about. But she lived on the edge of trying to make things in a way right for herself. And she started really ripping off the crooks in the end, um, taking money from them. If Nicola Gobbo wanted to make amends for all the things she got wrong, the infamous tomato tins bust was the way to do it. She'd been acting for Rob Karam on a separate matter when he told her he was organising an ecstasy shipment, his biggest ever. Three weeks before it arrived at the Melbourne docks, Karam handed Gobbo a shipping bill of lading for safekeeping while he made a court appearance. Why the hell would Rob Karam give her that document? He wouldn't want to have something like that on him uh, when he's going in and out of court. And in the breaks, um, Nicola Gobbo, Rob Karam and John Higgs are uh, going to a restaurant called Wheat, which was where she would tell people things or get information from them. She wouldn't do it in her chambers most often. She'd do it at this coffee shop restaurant. And that's where um, this, uh, this document's produced. Ever the Good Samaritan, Gobbo went straight to her chambers, made a copy and presented the document to her police handlers. Victoria Police um, have this golden moment where this document's presented to them and leads them straight to that container. The shipment arrived at the Port of Melbourne on June 28, 2007. More than 3,000 jumbo-sized tins of tomatoes, fresh from Italy. Except there were no tomatoes. Instead, 4.4 tonnes of ecstasy with a street value of $440 million. Police seized the drugs, stored them in a safe place and waited for the syndicate to start arguing amongst themselves. They don't know about it being seized and they spend weeks, months trying to get that container first off the docks 
And then when they can't, they need to go back and give their masters and excuses, where's this gone? Because there's no publicity about any kind of seizure. So they spend the next year trying to get $10 million to pay back uh, their Italian uh, f friends <laughs> back, in, back in Calabria. The friends in Calabria are far from amused. They summon the head of the Griffith Drug Connection, Pasquale Barbaro, to Italy, where he's held captive and interrogated over the missing ecstasy. Barbaro's life is in the balance, and he returns to Melbourne, promising to make good on the lost drugs. To ensure he keeps his word, the Calabrians send hitmen to Australia. Eventually, Barbaro, Rob Karam and others are arrested which probably saves their lives. Whenever that level of attention is put on you, you're obviously concerned for your family. Well, ruthless hitmen sitting off your house with high-powered rifles, hey, I'd be concerned. I think so. I think that would be a natural reaction. It took more than a year for the AFP to build prosecutions against the gang members. By then, the syndicate had organised a large shipment of cocaine to help pay the Calabrians for the missing tins of ecstasy. Police swooped on that shipment, as well as hoovering up the Tomato Tins gang. This is a great result. This is, this is what makes getting up in the morning and coming to work worthwhile. The Crooks double-crossing lawyer, Nicola Gobbo, is right by their side. Once they're arrested, she's uh, the first person to go down to try and bail them out. And she continues on with the head of the syndicate, Barbara, for months and years later, I think. You can just imagine the fury of Barbara and Karam when they read reports of the epic double cross by their most trusted lawyer. How deep and profound was the breach of trust? Absolutely total betrayal. The disgraced former lawyer admitted to helping police arrest Rob Caram, then legally representing him over the tomato tin ecstasy bust. He paid $60,000 in legal fees. She denied her actions crossed the criminal line. You know, looking back... Gobbo never had second thoughts about holding on to crooked cash. Did you consider that in doing so, uh, you'd obtain financial advantage or obtain money by deception? No. But it's clear her state of mind was deteriorating as her informing escalated. I wanted a tram to hit me on the way to court the morning because I could not work out how to not disappoint anyone or how to not let anyone down and how to get out of that mess without, or probably in a way that meant I didn't have to stand up to anyone, which is, seems to be what I had an inability to do. In 2015, once the lawyer X scandal was public knowledge, Gobbo wrote a letter to then Assistant Commissioner of Victoria Police, Steve Fontana. She claimed her motivation for informing was altruistic. However, her life had effectively been ruined. I have struggled to cope with the fact that my reputation has been completely destroyed and my ability to obtain employment within the legal profession or even utilising my four degrees and experience is hopeless. A Google search of my name is quite literally sickening. I also struggle to deal with the fact that any of this has happened given all the assurances I was given by police that my assistance would never be a matter of public knowledge. The reason she wrote that letter to Steve Fontana is because she's trying to position herself for a reward. She's, um, well, look, she's quite shameless on that front. Still to come, Gobbo's $2.8 million payday. Do you accept that if you didn't know, you should have known? Uh, yes. But who's really to blame for the mess? My greatest fear is the police themselves. In 2010, Nicola Gobbo extracted a $2.8 million payout from Victoria Police after she claimed ill health and refused to testify against Paul Dale over the Hodson murders. She'd originally asked for $30 million. My goodness, Kel, would that have happened in your day? Absolutely not. I can't believe that Victoria Police would have paid out two or three million dollars to Nicola Gobbo uh, without the sanction of the government of the day. 
I mean, ultimately, they would have required the sanction of at least the police minister to make that payment. You know, looking at that, there's a lot more to come in relation to the whole affair. What they knew and when they knew it. Yeah, that's right. At the Royal Commission, current and former police bosses, including Commissioner Simon Overland, have run a mile from Nicola Gobbo. Can I suggest you weren't doing your job properly? Well, again, I don't accept that. Despite heading up the Piranha Task Force, Simon Overland swears he wasn't told Nicola Gobbo was providing information to police about Tony Mockbell as part of the operation to bring down the drug kingpin syndicate. It is fanciful that you were not aware that Gobbo was representing Mockbell at the time that he um, left. No, it's not fanciful. I, I may have. I, I don't recall whether I did or I didn't. Do you accept, as a person who was ultimately responsible for this investigation, that if you didn't know, you should have known? Uh, yes. Up until the Royal Commission, Simon Overland had the reputation of being the man that ended the gangland war. When he gets in the Commission, he barely remembers a thing. He said he knew that Nicola Gobbo was being used as an informant. He didn't know that she was being used to provide information against her clients. If police were going to use uh, a lawyer to give evidence about their own clients, they ought to realise, just as a, an operational issue, it was absolutely stupid. So I think the management of the whole issue was absolutely appalling. And of course, Nicola Gobbo was quite unique. Clearly, she loved the attention. She loved playing the dual role. She must have got a real adrenaline rush out of that, I believe. And it's cost her her career and uh, put a life at risk, potentially. I'm sure she's had dealings with police and measures have been taken to protect her, but there's no doubt that um, this isn't a flippant issue. She's someone that needs to be protected, and so do her children, um, for, the, for the rest of their lives. And is she getting adequate protection, as far as you know? Oh, I believe so. Are you scared someone might try to kill you? There's always going to be a risk, um, but my greatest fear is the police themselves. To, to kill you? Well, to either to kill me or to lead, to lead to a position where I am killed. There's less likely for her to be fearful of the crooks as fearful of the establishment now and whereas she was protected by Vic Paul for all those years, she's no longer protected by a new Vic Paul command and a new Premier and a new Attorney General and a new Director of Public Prosecutions. And that would minimise the overall damage to the state of Victoria if she is charged. It remains to be seen who will be held responsible for this fiasco. Former Chief Commissioner Simon Overland has tried to immunise himself by putting the blame on Gobbo's handlers. Gobbo herself accepts little responsibility, shamelessly seeking even more compensation, as those she betrayed try to win their freedom because of her betrayal. How many do you think have a show of actually getting out Obviously, there's been one uh, conviction overturned, that of Farouk Gorman. Tasting his first moments of freedom in 12 years. The three judges of the Court of Appeal ruled that the police informer's betrayal of her client was enough to set him free. There was accordingly a substantial miscarriage of justice. The appeal must therefore be allowed. Leaving the door open for him to cash in on his ordeal. I'd imagine there'd be at least three or four more who have a real good shot at it, um, who are in, in prison. Tony Mockbell will try. And obviously, Karam is another one whose case is coming up. If some guilty crooks walk free from jail because of Gobbo, that's a terrible outcome. But I'm actually more concerned about those who remain free because of her. The cold case murders of Terry and Christine Hodson and Shane Chartres Abbott could still be solved if Victoria Police acted on the evidence they had years ago. Too much time and money has been spent on chasing innocent people like David Waters with the connivance of Nicola Gobbo. I think it's pretty straightforward, Adam. 
you go back to the basics, the original murder investigation, and follow the evidence. The evidence doesn't lie. 